It's been 27 years since the federal prison system executed an inmate. And now, after all this time, it's happening in our own backyard. In the next 30 minutes, you'll hear dramatic testimony from people who are both for and against the death penalty. Plus, in his own words, one death row inmate speaks to us about life on death row. We'll also examine all the preparations being made to ensure the safety of both the public and the community. Here now is Tom McClanahan. Good morning. In just two days, Juan Raul Garza is scheduled to be put to death by lethal injection, the first federal execution since 1963. In this special report, An Eye for an Eye, we'll take a look at the pros and cons of the death penalty. The prison has been preparing for this day for quite a while, and so has the community, especially local police. Earlier this year, around 120 local police officers experienced a rigorous training program. These officers are now ready to help secure the federal prison during an execution. The date of the first scheduled execution has already been changed several times, and the pending execution set for the 12th could still be postponed. But someday, Terre Haute will host a federal execution, and the police must be ready into the federal prison got some training from their folks it didn't cost us anything uh, we had a lot of equipment we're requiring some more but uh, we're doing mostly in-house training we're doing training before shifts and after shifts which uh, doesn't call us or cause us to have people come in and get the largest amount of overtime officers learn different maneuvers on handling large crowds of people especially if the crowd turns angry and while this training is designed to help at the prison the techniques they are learning can be used in many other situations. Prison workers and members of the media have also gone through training sessions. In November, Warden Harley Lappin went through the protocol that everyone must follow on execution day. Every member of the media who plans to be on prison property that day is already registered with the prison. Anyone not on the list will not be allowed past the main gate. And no more than 10 members of the news media will be allowed to witness the execution. Those witnesses will be named three hours prior to the execution itself. The public has also had a chance to learn more about the execution through the Campus and Community Luncheon Series. Here's an example of how two of those luncheons were conducted. Uh, Warden Harley Lappin talks about what it's like, time. the condition, the employees, the inmates, and the environment of death row. It takes special folks to decide they want to work in a correctional setting. I mean, uh, we're public servants. And uh, I mean, we're not, we're dealing with a unique group of uh, people uh, who have been shunned by society to some degree. Those in attendance had questions about the prison and the goal of this luncheon was to inform. Inform the public of the type of housing unit these individuals are currently being incarcerated. Uh, that we are continuing to provide programs of a variety of nature. While death row is the end of the line for inmates, Chaplain Scott Paul Bonham says their punishment is confinement, and the prison tries to make the situation as easy as possible for the inmates and the staff. I think that's probably a, a misperception, or misperception in the public about that issue, that we continue to have programs. And again, it's a great way to keep uh, individuals busy, uh, a little easier to manage, but also occupies their time. To get a different perspective, defense attorney Jesse Cook was also invited to be a guest speaker she represented a legal overview of the death penalty. Cook says many death row inmates have their cases either overturned or thrown out. We see that a majority of the death penalties which are overturned, uh, regardless of the level at which they're overturned, are overturned either because there was ineffective representation by counsel at trial or because law enforcement or prosecutors um, failed to disclose exculpatory information. Well, most everyone at these luncheon series had questions about the execution chamber itself, mainly because it is kept so secretive. The death chamber was constructed in 1995, and that was the last time the media or the public has been allowed to see it. This $300,000 facility is the only place in the country where federal prisoners will be executed. There are six windows looking into the chamber from five separate rooms, which are reserved for family members, prison officials, selected community witnesses, reporters, and the executioner. The executioner will be behind a one-way glass so no one can identify him. As Juan Raul Garza sits in death row at the local penitentiary, 
President Clinton is the only person who can prevent Garza's execution. Well, who is Juan Raul Garza, and why does he think his life should be spared? It all began years ago in Brownsville, Texas. Garza was convicted of killing three men in Brownsville between April 1990 and January of 1991. Before that, he was indicted for being the leader of a drug ring that imported tons of marijuana from Mexico into the U.S. And he was also linked to five other murders, four of them in Mexico. Garza's attorneys claim the death penalty is imposed unfairly on minorities, like himself, and imposed more in certain parts of the country, like Texas, which leads the nation in state executions. The president is waiting for a Justice Department review of Garza's claim before he makes a decision. Clinton could issue a moratorium on the federal death penalty in general, postponing Garza's execution. Or he could choose not to interfere, which would mean that Garza would be put to death Tuesday. Well, the president has a tough choice in this matter. Clinton is a supporter of the death penalty, but groups wanting him to stop this execution and others include many of his political supporters. The president has not made a decision at the time we tape this program and has until the time of Garza's execution to act or to not interfere. Just about everyone has an opinion on the death penalty, and when we come back, you'll hear both sides. First, those who support the death penalty. We'll recount the 1988 Vigo County murder of Dolores Wells, hear from her stepfather, and see why he believes execution is an appropriate punishment. In 1988, Bill Benefield was sent to death row in Indiana for kidnapping and murdering 18-year-old Dolores Wells. It was the last death penalty case Vigo County has seen, and one that won't soon be forgotten. Bill Adler prosecuted the Benefield case 10 years ago. It's one case he'll never forget. I always want to go home and take a shower after dealing with this case because it's just it was the, the treatment that he, that he waged against these women as well as other women who testified was so horrific, unspeakable. You can't believe that a, one human being can treat other human beings the way he treated these people. Two young women were kidnapped by Benefield and held captive in this home for 12 days. 18-year-old Dolores Wells didn't survive the torture, but Alicia Elmore did. She watched Benefield suffocate Dolores, squirting glue in her nose and wrapping duct tape around her face. Dolores' family attends every one of Benefield's appeal hearings, waiting for closure. The victims don't have no rights. It's all in the criminal's favor. They can lay up there on death row at the taxpayer's expense, they get their medical expenses paid, their meals, everything's furnished up. Benefield keeps the same smirk on his face at every hearing, but he rarely speaks. He listens as court-appointed attorneys argue that the death penalty is cruel and unusual punishment. And this ongoing appeals process is what keeps the anger alive inside Dolores' stepfather. You shouldn't even ask me about that because I'll tell you, if they want to know what cruel and unusual punishment is, what about what he did to Dolores when you talk about cruel and unusual? How many people would take a person out and do what he did to Dolores? That's unusual punishment. Benefield has exhausted all of his appeals to the state of Indiana. The case is now before the United States Supreme Court. 
No new execution date has been set for Bill Benefield. A man who has seen Bill Benefield a few times, and none of those times did he like that, is Al Hagen, who was Dolores Wells' stepfather. He is Dolores Wells' stepfather. Al, thank you for joining us this morning on the program. Well. You are certainly in favor of the death penalty. Tell me why you are a supporter of capital punishment. Well, Tom, if you do the crime, you've got to pay the penalty. And that's what we got judges and juries for, is to make these sentences. And Bill Benefield has been sentenced to death, of course, that's 14 years since he committed this crime. Mm -hmm. And he's still laying on death row up there. And this, I'll tell you, uh, I don't know what the answer would be. I'm sure there's probably some innocent people who have been executed, and I feel sorry for them. Because mm -hmm. I can imagine what it would be like. I've tried to put myself in this position if I was ever convicted of murder. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was innocent. But in this case, we know he's not innocent. Mm -hmm. You've attended all of the appeals processes, or uh, every time he comes back to Vigo County, as we pointed out in the report there. What goes through your mind when you're sitting there in the courtroom or standing outside the courtroom while he's in there in an appeal uh, mode? Describe how you feel when you see the guy, when you're looking through the window and, and look at him. Well, I'm uh, probably just as close to him at times as I, what I am to you right now. And I would just love to grab him by the neck and choke him, but I know I can't do that. That is against the law. I'm not allowed to do that. So it's against the law for him to do what he did, too. Mm -hmm. How about the victims? You mentioned in the uh, interview there that uh, victims, the rights of victims seem to be affected now by the rights of the accused as well. Uh, the victims don't have no rights. Uh, we have been told that once they're dead, they're dead, that's it. Mm -hmm. They don't handle rights. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, how does your wife feel about this? I mean, you both uh, attend the appeals uh, sessions locally. Uh, do you talk about this a lot? Oh, yes, we talk about it from time to time, and it aggravates us because he is still laying up there on death row, getting his three meals a day, and he gets all medical expenses paid, at the taxpayer's expense. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we hear that victims' uh, families or those who know the victims of crime, once the sentence is passed along that there is a form of closure. Uh, do you feel like if they do in fact execute Bill Benefield and put him to death up in Michigan City that you and your wife and others who knew Dolores will feel that this is over or have you thought about that? Yes, we have thought about that. Uh, It'll never be over. We think about it all the time. And even if they do execute him, at what time they do execute him, it's not going to be over for us because she's still laying in that grave up there in the cemetery. And she got a 16-year-old son now that she didn't get to see raised. Mm -hmm. David, little David, was two years old when this all took place. And he don't even remember his mother. Has he asked questions? Have you talked to him about this whole thing? at this uh, point in time, or are you waiting, or how does that work? Well, it's very so. We see David from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know when the last time my wife had him, but we do see David from time to time. Of course, he's 16 years old now. He's a young man now. Uh, let me ask you this. Are, if, in fact, uh, they do execute, and when they execute Bill Benefield at Michigan City, will you be there, or can you be there? If I can be there, yes, I'll be there. You want to attend I will that be there. particular thing. And if I'd like to be on the inside to see that it happens. Mm -hmm. But I will be, if, not, if I'm not allowed inside, I will be outside. At Michigan City. At Michigan City, wherever it might be carried out at. Al, one final question. There are a lot of people who oppose the death penalty for various reasons. What would you say to them? Well, everyone's got their own belief. Uh, I think... I know there's a lot of people that oppose the death penalty, but they ought to try to put themselves in the position that we're in. And to lose a loved one like this, unnecessary. Overall, do you think uh, that the, do you feel confident in the, in the appeals process if in fact Bill Benefield is executed? Do you think he should have had all these chances? No, I don't think it should have been carried on this long. Like I say, this happened January 26, 1987. 
And here it is, almost January of 2001, 14 years ago. And he's still here. And he's still up there on death row in Michigan City. And uh -huh. Dolores is laying in her grave up there at the cemetery. She don't get to see her family. Like he, I don't know whether yeah. his family even goes up to see him anymore or not. I don't know. Well, thanks, Al, for your participation well. this morning on the program. Now it is time to hear from the other side. Those who oppose the death penalty are very vocal about their beliefs. We'll take you to one of the recent protests and talk to a local activist who wants the death penalty abolished when we come back. Welcome back. The day it was announced that Terre Haute would be home to the first federal execution, protesters began preparing for the inevitable. In November, a journey of hope began in Indianapolis, ending five days later at the federal pen here in Terre Haute. This is just one of many protests that have been held in the past few months, but they all have the same purpose. The goal is to spread their message that the death penalty should be abolished. We're convinced that it's gonna take education uh, to bring the death penalty to an end and what we have been doing for these last five days is educating the public And if you believe that love and compassion for all humanity is the answer You don't have to talk about the death penalty because if you have love and compassion You're not going to want to see anybody strapped into the death chamber The prison has a designated area where the protesters can stand and very specific rules they must follow Demonstrators will be bussed into the prison starting at one minute after midnight on Monday no food or drinks will be permitted. Demonstrators will only be permitted to bring a poster and a candle with a windshield. Participants are also required to have photo identification. Buses will then begin transporting demonstrators back to their cars immediately following the execution. One person who is preparing to protest the execution is with us tonight. It's not, won't be the first time for Sister Joan Slobig, the Sisters of Providence out at St. Mary of the Woods. Thank you for coming to our program this morning. Thank you for inviting me, Tom. Uh, you had a, we, we have talked before this segment, and you've talk, talked about a face of the accused as well as the victim. I thought that was an interesting point. I think in, in trying to address the issue of capital punishment, that's, that it's important to put a face on those on death row, just as it's important to put a face on the victim. And that often it's uh, difficult for us in trying to separate the, the person from the person's behavior. And I think when we can do that, that that's very helpful then in trying to form our own uh, conscience about this issue. Just like the gentleman just said, uh, he believes that education is very important, and you do as well. Certainly as a, a member of the Sisters of Providence who've been in the Ministry of Education since 1840 here in the Wabash Valley, uh, one of our, our our prime goals related to this issue of the death penalty is to educate, is to try to help people to become clear about facts and about some of the myths that are out there so that they can, they can make an informed decision for themselves. Have you done this before? Have you protested uh, capital punishment before? Yes, I have. As a matter of fact, I joined with about 60 other members of women's religious congregations about two years ago here in Terre Haute and we did a, 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 a prayer witness out at the federal penitentiary at that time mm -hmm. as a, a, a statement of our position against the death penalty and to try to call attention to the issue here in the community. And I've also uh, joined with groups in uh, Columbus, Ohio in, in uh, protesting against the death penalty. What would you say to a family member of a victim who obviously is emotionally charged and, and wants to see the perpetrator against them die. What would you tell them? I think that as a, a woman of faith, that certainly my message is that the, the uh, gospel message, the message of Jesus, Jesus is one of love, not of revenge. And I think that often victims of violent crimes find that the death penalty does not bring closure for them. It's not a way of coming to terms with their own pain and suffering. And so I think it's important to 
uh, to talk about those kinds of things with, with persons who are victims of violence. Certainly their, uh, their pain is very real, their pain is, is uh, understandable. Uh, those men and women on death row also experience pain and that pain too is understandable. But I think that um, a society that chooses to deal with the issue of killing by killing someone to show that killing is wrong certainly needs to rethink its position. We have just about a half a minute left in this segment. What do you expect if in fact the execution goes forward in two days from now? What do I expect? What do you expect? Of the, do you uh, think you'll be joined by a lot of protesters? Um, I, that'll, that'll be interesting to see. I'm not, uh, I don't know. I would hope that there will be numbers of people who will come out in, in uh, as a way of making a public statement, of doing a public witness, of, of gathering together in solidarity to pray for not only those men and women on death row, to pray for Juan Garza if he is executed, but also to pray for all victims of violence and their families. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sister Joan Slobig of the Sisters of Providence out of St. Mary of the Woods College. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. And uh, even inmates, I must say, have an opinion on the death penalty. And when we come back, death row inmate David Paul Hammer speaks with us about his life behind bars. Hear why he requested to be executed, but has since changed his mind. In February, David Paul Hammer is set to be the second federal inmate to die at the Terre Haute Federal Penitentiary. His execution date was originally November 15th, but a presidential stay was issued and his date was moved back three months, a date that Hammer is apparently ready for. If you're going to give a person a death penalty and you mean it, then you should carry it out. I've tried for a year to get the United States government to execute me. And it will. David Paul Hammer has been in prison for over half his life. He has roamed these walls of death row for many months with little to do. I spend probably five hours a day in correspondence. I read my Bible, I pray, I meditate. Um, I spend an awful lot of time looking out the window. During the first half of his life, Hammer spent a lot of time breaking the law, including mail fraud and a murder for hire scheme in Tennessee. Leaving home at 13, he never looked back at a horrible beginning to his life. My parents were, they were very abusive, mainly my mother. My mother was the dominant person in my family, and uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, verbal, physical abuse. That dysfunctional beginning led him to Terre Haute's death row. A simple existence of breakfast each morning at 5.30, a shower three times a week, and recreation time in these outdoor cages. He has spoken on several occasions with fellow death row inmate Timothy McVeigh, who Hammer characterizes as intelligent with a good sense of humor and not the monster that many believe he is. But the eye that Hammer took that he must pay for with his own is the death of his cellmate in Pennsylvania, Andrew Marty, back in 1996. I've, I've thought back on it, I've relived it over and over. A letter from Marty to his father days before Hammer strangled him could have triggered the fatal mistake. 
in this letter, Andrew was begging with uh, his father to give him a second chance and not to consider him the black sheep of the family. And uh, and to see the pain that I had caused, if there was a moment during any of this that that I really realized what I had done. It was at that point. Despite appeals that have delayed that final day, David Paul Hammer knows there is not much left on this earth for him. To me, after 21 and a half years of continuous incarceration, um, I look at it as a relief. The execution of David Paul Hammer has been set and reset so often that it is still unclear if he will die at the federal prison in February. A paralegal, Hammer received yet another appeal after he changed his mind. It appears, though, that his ability to appeal and the grounds with which to make that appeal are nearly over. He, along with us, will find out sometime between now and February 21st. With the first execution at the tarot pen just two days away, possibly things still must be done. When we come back, we'll give you a rundown of what death row inmate Juan Raul Garza will be doing in his final hours, as well as what preparations are still being made by the prison. On this Sunday morning, Juan Raul Garza could be in the execution building right now at the federal prison. The timetable for the scheduled execution is formal. There are specific rules. Garza will be transferred to the actual execution building between 24 and 72 hours before he is put to death. The inmate cannot be in the execution room earlier than one hour prior to the time of the lethal injection. Garza does not choose his last meal. It has not been finalized but it will be the same as the prison lunch meal the day prior to the execution, in this case, Monday's meal. And even for his last meal, there is a spending limit of no more than $20. Once Garza gets to the execution building, there is no set agenda for him to follow. He may visit with his family or an attorney. He can watch television or read, basically his choice until the time that the lethal injection process begins, which is 9 a.m. the day after tomorrow. The penitentiary is already under tight security. It has established very strict rules that all visitors, demonstrators, and the media must follow leading up to the execution. If you want to be a part of this historical event, here is some information you need to know. An information resource center opened on Friday to answer questions from the public. The phone number there is 812-234-0067. Hours run until 7 o'clock tonight and then it will reopen at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning and stay open until 3 p.m. on Tuesday. At the time of this taping, Juan Raul Garza was set to die by lethal injection at 9 a.m. Tuesday morning. But whether it's Garza or another inmate, Terre Haute will host the first federal execution. After watching this report, you decide. Is Terre Haute ready? And do you believe capital punishment is truly an eye for an eye? I'm Tom McClanahan. Thanks for joining. News Channel 2, best news.